happened to be, but clearly in one sense it's extremely specific and it's the implications of what we must actually do that I intend to, that I'm going to be just exploring uh, in, in this talk if we are to ever uh, 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 deliver the well-being of all sentience. Um, as I said, uh, um, even, I mean, it might seem as though transhumanists have very little set to say uh, to religious uh, people, but if you're a Buddhist, for instance, Buddhists locate suffering at the heart of the world, uh, um, but unfortunately uh, the Noble Eightfold Path or whatnot is not going to you know, get rid of the food chain, it's not going to dismantle the hedonic treadmill, uh, and and likewise, uh, for instance, Christianity or Islam uh, say that we have an all-merciful God, and if mere mortals uh, can uh, envisage uh, a world without cruelty, a cruelty-free world, it's hard to imagine that God would be more limited uh, in his aspirations. Um, one thing I perhaps sh should stress is that we're talking uh, uh, about voluntary uh, uh, suffering, no one's talking about uh, dragging people off to the pleasure chambers or anything like that. Um, uh, so, so, yes, I think the relevant question is, once it becomes technically feasible to abolish all forms of suffering, should anyone uh, be forced to suffer against their will? And surprisingly, even people who think or say they're opposed, actually, if you put them on the spot, very few will actually say, yes, people should be forced to suffer. And then you ask them, well, what forms of coercion, etc., etc. So, I think that's the critical question. Um, I'm slightly dodging the issue. There are a couple of questions here. Uh, what about non-human animals? Can they uh, consent uh, to, uh, uh, to the kinds of radical intervention, ecosystem redesign I'm going to be discussing? Uh, in one sense, no, but at the same time, uh, a non-human animal that is eating, uh, being eaten alive or dying of hunger or thirst, I think it can be uh, implicitly assumed that they do not want to be eaten or suffer torment. Uh, final complication to the consent issue is that I'm going to be arguing that we're due for a reproductive revolution of designer babies and that more and more parents will increasingly choose to have children who are predisposed uh, to states of ever greater happiness, i.e. the hedonic, the set point of the hedonic treadmill will be raised. And you could argue that babies, children who are born and naturally happy and eventually super happy won't really be choosing. But that's a question of what should be the default condition. Should one's default condition be mental super health or the current discontented, malaise-ridden state a lot of us spend a lot of the time in? Okay, um, different ways to get rid of uh, suffering. Um, first, very briefly, I'm going to discuss wireheading. Uh, wireheading, if you recall, is the implantation of electrodes in what used to be called the pleasure centres of the brain. Um, it never gets uh, boring. The, uh, the rat or the monkey or, the, for that matter, the human can carry on pressing. It's just as rewarding uh, after... 10 hours is after 10 minutes. I stress this isn't the future as I see it uh, of civilization. Uh, why? Well, not least because there will be extreme selection pressure against wireheading. Clearly, uh, wireheads aren't focused on raising baby wireheads. A um, couple of technical com complications. I, I said they used to be called the pleasure centers. Um, there's some debate actually as to just how happy wireheads are. There's, uh, there's some research suggesting that the mesolimbic dopamine system, where we normally locate uh, the pleasure centres, uh, is actually focused on the anticipation of, of, of reward and incentive motivation, desire if you like, whereas uh, the mu opioid receptors uh, mediate pure bliss. And this, uh, so uh, we have, uh, thanks to technology, the ability to independently mediate, uh, to modulate both uh, emotion, uh, sorry, motivation and bliss. I mean, you could argue, I mean, the Buddhist idea of uh, vision of uh, the extinction of desire, pure bliss, and that is mu, mu opioid uh, activation without uh, 
dopamine simulation, whereas pure dopamine activation is pure desire. Um, sorry for that little technical ramble, I don't know if there are any uh, specialists in the audience, but basically wireheading it shows that, that uh, in the broadest sense, uh, uh, pleasure uh, never gets boring. There is no, uh, no feedback mechanisms that stop you finding uh, 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 wireheading rewarding. And the challenge is not to get rid of suffering or, de or deliver unlimited uh, bliss. The challenge, really, the technical challenge is to do so that preserve high functioning well-being. Uh, that don't compromise uh, intellectual performance, social responsibilities, empathetic understanding. And that is uh, a much bigger challenge. Um, Okay, why heading? Second uh, possible option you might think for getting rid of suffering is uh, uh, drugs, ranging uh, from uh, recreational drugs to clinical drugs to Huxley's notional soma. Um, now, clearly, drugs have a lot of pitfalls. Uh, we know most of today's street drugs are pretty trashy, they can deliver some wonderful experiences in the short run, but on the whole, uh, they simply activate the brain's negative feedback mechanisms. Um, drug taking needn't be purely hedonistic in the amoral and crassest sense. One thinks of a drug like uh, MDMA or ecstasy, which can induce uh, empathetic uh, love and understanding and compassion, but it's not any kind of long-term solution, because after taking it, uh, the user experiences a long, drawn-out reversal of all the good things they experienced on the drug. Um, what about uh, clinical drugs, so-called antidepressants? Um, well, they help uh, some people, but I don't know who's been following the re recent controversies, uh, the scandals in Big Pharma. It seems that most of today's uh, antidepressants don't actually deliver results that are significantly above uh, a placebo in many cases. The publication bias has systematically uh, corrupted the process of, of, of scientific medicine. That's not to say that they're, they're not useful, at least in some contexts, but they are extremely limited. And one of the reasons why uh, of, for their limitations may well be that they target, they don't target uh, the uh, opioid system uh, or the dopamine system, depressive people or just people with low mood who are, who are normal or frequently uh, melancholic or sad or under-motivated and clearly the, the opioids and dopaminergic drugs um, all have considerable abuse potential. Um, so even if uh, in future there's a, a revolution in designer drugs and we have much, much better targeted, superior uh, drugs. Uh, um, it may well be that the only, uh, yes, the only way to tackle depressive states is uh, the opioid system, and this is obviously extremely prob problematic. Uh, one of the main problems with taking opioids, for instance, is that it makes people emotionally self-sufficient. They're not motivated to, uh, to, to, to raise children, and it's hard to imagine a future civilization of, 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 junk, of so to speak, junkies. Um, and even Huxley's uh, soma was in many ways akin to uh, opioids. Um, now, I personally think that anyone who's severely depressed should have the right to take opioids until we, until we find some, something better, but it's, it's not the long-term solution, and if we were to rely on pharmacology to get rid of suffering amongst humans, one would be essentially medicating children from birth, which is clearly <coughs> extremely unsatisfactory. So, um, a lot more can clearly be said about drugs, and, for, and pharmacology, they're clearly less uh, irreversible than genetic engineering, but it's actually um, on genetics and the reproductive revolution that I personally think uh, the future lies. Um, I speak of this term, reproductive revolution, um, as, as you know, we've, it cracks the, the uh, unravel the human genome, and within the next a few decades, more and more parents will be choosing the genetic makeup of their future children, starting with a number of crude parameters, but 
eventually all sorts of personality variables. And there is going to be, I would argue, uh, extreme selection pressure against genes, 